I've been on this for a little while. I've taught several lessons to you guys from this. So some of you have heard this. We're going to try to summarize it. The last time I discussed this, uh, my partner said I did, she didn't understand what I said. I said, that's kind of the story. And I just want to summarize a few things, and then I want to really focus on chapter 7, verse 15, really. And, and, and I'll summarize a few ideas, and maybe more, but let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Take a moment. Make sure you're yielded to the Spirit. Confess any known sins. Be ready to open your heart to the message. Well, Father, we're grateful for your grace and mercy. We're thankful that you've prov provided everything that we need to be saved and secure forever, to be spiritual in this life, to be secure for the next, to have eternal rewards and live with you forever, have a wonderful body we're going to receive like the Lord's that's like a Superman body. We're going to be this mighty force for God all through eternity. What a, what, what a great image to, to live for, to live toward. Help us to understand, Father, the challenges, the difficulties of being born in Adam and all the results that have come into our life and now the challenge of allowing the Spirit to lead us and guide us into victory. Pray that we'd understand what victory is and how to achieve it. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The book of Romans is, of course, one of the great books that Paul wrote. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with our total depravity. In chapter 1, he talks about unrestrained lasciviousness. Chapter 2, he talks about unrestrained religiousness, the self-righteous person, the religious person, both different sides of the sin nature. In chapter 3 is where we get the great verse, you know, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then he goes into chapter 4 and talks about grace, versus works. Chapter 5, he starts out, we have peace with God. Here's where he gets into real solutions and the practical life. The first thing you need to know is that because of what Christ has done, in your trust in his work, you have peace with God. And that's not the peace in you from God. That's the peace judicially. You're no longer the enemy of God. You have peace with God. We've been reconciled to God. Now, that's a positional judicial fact. That's who you are now. That's your status with God now. There's no more enmity. There's no more war. There's no more separation. You're in Christ who's in God. Bingo. Now, he gets into six. He's going to get into mechanics, the real nuts and bolts of the problem and the solution. Six through eight is going to really de detail that. So in chapter six... 1 through 11 is positional victory, giving us the possibility of practical victory. And 12 through 23, practical victory, breaking free from slavery to sinful habits of thinking and behavior. Sinful habits. 1 through 6, he talks about the two great possibilities. Position in Christ opens the possibilities of the Christian life in time. Ron talked in the first half about the three phases of sanctification. The first phase is from the time you're born as a human being to you're born again as a believer in Christ. At that very moment that you're born again, God does the 50 things. After the 50 things, he enters you into a transformation process that goes on till the day you die. That's phase two. Phase three is the day you die. The moment you die, you enter into eternity. We're in this second phase right now, and the goal is spiritual growth, reaching a place of maturity and service out of that. All right? So these great possibilities lay out that whole phase two. The first possibility is in verse four. He says that we may walk. Let me read that to you, verse four. He says, therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism, now this is not water baptism, this is spirit baptism, into him through baptism into his death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk, now this is a Christian life, in newness of life. 
Here's your new man living. Here's living like Christ, thinking like Christ, feeling like Christ, believing like Christ, walking like Christ, deciding like Christ. This comes out of accumulated understanding of God's Word that builds this new man, out, this new man person inside of you. Well, you got this new man person that was a baby at salvation. 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes. It's a baby at salvation. This new person created by the Holy Spirit, this a bara, just like he created the universe, he created this new spiritual person inside of you, has to grow up. The Bible gives us five different Greek words for these phases of growth. Just like human growth and development, there's spiritual growth and development unto the mature man and then the mature adult. So we're in that process. That's the new man. But he says there's a great challenge. And he goes on in verse 6 and says, here's a second great possibility. He says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Christ, just like in verse 4, this is positional sanctification, so that, here's a future possibility, our old self was crucified with him that our, that our, so that our body of sin might be torn down or done away with, that we should no longer be servants to sin. First possibility, build a new man. Second possibility, tear down the old man. Okay? Those two to go together to create spiritual growth. He goes on. And look and, and talks about in 12 through 14, if you'll follow with me, he says, therefore, do not allow sin to rule or reign in your mortal body that you, you should obey its desires and stop presenting your members, that's the word yielding, real important, yielding the members of your bodies to sin or the sin nature as instruments of unrighteousness. Instead, See, now as a believer, you have an option. Instead, yield your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Why? For sin shall not be master over you. You are not under law. Law made sin your master, but you're under grace. Grace frees you not only from, from law, but the slavery to the sin nature. It's a grace plan. God frees you. You can't free yourself See, if you try to free yourself from sin through your own self-discipline, you create religion. It's human ability, human works, human plan to please God. You do all this goodness, then you offer it to God as, as the means of your salvation, and that's called religion. That's what self-righteousness is. You have to end up comparing yourself with other people instead of with Christ. So, that's religion. Now, so... The key word in 12 through 14, this is where we choose to break our master-slave yielding relationship with the sin nature and instead choose to embrace a master-slave yielding relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I, I label this redirecting desire. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 explain that the sin nature produces well, see, desire is just an absolute of the soul. You're going to desire. There's just way God motivates you. You're going to attach that either to the sin nature and the strategies that come from the sin nature, or you're going to attach that to the Holy Spirit, and you're the decider. You're the decider. Problem is, you've spent years developing this old man side, these strategies these are your habits of life. And even though you may very look good on the outside, on the inside, you know, you, these habits of sinfulness, either religious type sinfulness, self-righteousness, I'm better than others, or I'm a good person because I don't do this or that, or lascivious type. Either way, he says, what you must do is yield, present yourself. The word paristomy to present, to place beside, to surrender, to place at someone's disposal for use. I'm here, use me. That's peristomy. Either you're going to yield yourself 
to your sin nature ideas or are you going to yield yourself to the ministry of the Holy Spirit? That's what we discussed the first half, yielding to the Holy Spirit. So, confession reinstates to fellowship. It's like being in neutral. Yielding allows the Spirit to influence you again. You come out from under this, in, this sin nature influence. You've, you've admitted that to God. Now you're here in this place, and the goal is to yield to the Spirit. Yield to the Spirit. So, yielding obediently allows the Spirit to dominate and influence your thinking. And that's the goal, is the Spirit to influence your choices. The way you think, the way you feel, and the way you choose. So, let's look at 16 through 23. I'm just following this down to give you just an idea that we're not studying this. This is, let me tell you, one of the hardest things for me has been to kind of summarize this big hunk. I've been trying, this is my third time to try to do it. I don't think I'm <laughs> doing very well, but we're getting there. In 16, he says, do, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, that you are, are become slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death, that's temporal death, not, not eternal death, or obedience resulting in righteousness. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching which you were given, and you have been freed from sin, becoming slaves of righteousness. So, whichever one you consistently give in to, you become a servant of. Now, this is the, process, the, the principle of habituation, where is the, something you choose and choose and choose becomes habit. It's the way the human system works. Everything is habit. You, you learn to put your pants on a certain way, and then you find yourself 10 years later putting them on the same way. You don't even think about it, right? Something becomes a habit, so you sin in a certain way, you sin in a certain way, and, you, and before you know it, it's become a habit. It's just how you instinctively act. In chapter 7, verse 15, he's going to explain that to us. So this is called enslavement. Enslavement of the will from habituation, which means automatic reactions, caused by consistent choices to fulfill the hunger of the soul by yielding to either the sin nature or the Holy Spirit. You see, you yield to the sin nature to fill this hunger of the soul, this desire. You do it again and then again, and you form this habit of moving in that direction. You just react. That's why you have these reactions to certain things in your life. You just do it. It just is there before you know it. You're like, I didn't even feel myself choosing that. Why? Because it's become just a deeply ingrained habit. Same with the Holy Spirit. You choose the Spirit, Spirit, Spirit. You begin to form the habit over here. Those of you who have grown spiritually in, in, into this mature place, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you're just naturally yielded to the Spirit in these areas of your life. Some areas you haven't gotten there yet. Some areas you're still struggling with. But in these some areas, you've, you've, you've gained victory. You don't ever go there again. I mean, maybe you used to smoke years ago. You know, a lot of people my age smoked for, you know, and then one day you said, the Lord doesn't want me doing this. It's bad for my health. It's bad for my witness. You know, it's bad for getting the girls type of thing. And uh, so you gave it up. And now I wouldn't even consider that. It's not because I don't like the pleasures that come with it. Of course, it's nasty. But it's because the spirit, I've, I, my life is in the spirit. It's in the spirit. And I, and I turned that into the habit of life. Now, so he says, <clears throat> what you consistently yield to without confession and the word of God becomes a journey into enslavement, reaching to the sin unto death. He says, what you also consistently yield to if you'll go back with me to verse 19, he said, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. 
Just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, literally he says, and to lawlessness unto more law un lawlessness. In other words, when you give in to your sin nature and form this habit of giving in to your sin nature and you're gratifying the desire, the lust of your flesh, it can never be satisfied. Your flesh always wants more. And, it, and what you do to gratify it becomes less and less effective the more you do it. This is how people become addicted to anything. You know, uh, people, somebody took a drink when they were a teenager and they thought, man, that was the greatest feeling ever. And so they tried to take another drink thinking they'd get the same feeling. I've talked to alcoholics, people that are called alcoholics, and they've said, you know, I took that first drink and I tried to get that feeling for the next 20 years. I never could get it. Why? Because when you try to gratify your flesh in one way, then you have to do more and more and more and more to get the same feeling, and you never do. More means less. So, he says, when you, when you go down this journey, listen, any deviation from the will of God creates a degenerating process. You immediately begin this process of degenerating. It's like entropy. And the will of God is what keeps you pure, keeps you safe, keeps you growing, keeps you going in the right direction. Any deviation, it's not, it's not that God is punishing you, it's that you're, you've entered into this degenerating, this law of degeneration. Anything apart from the will of God is degeneration. Pure and simple. When you habit that, then you create this habit of, de of de destroying yourself, degenerating yourself. Not good habit. In verse chapter 7, 1 through 6, we have the marriage metaphor. Married to the law. Your sin nature is married to the law. But now the new man's married to Christ. He says, we died to the law in Christ, and we're now engaged to Christ to be his bride. He goes on in chapter 7, verse 14, and talks about 14 through 23 as the believers in our conflict. And this is what I want to talk about. Your desire, love, and loyalty to the ex-husband, the sin nature, that's why you keep going back to sin. This is the metaphor. Or your love and loyalty to your new husband, Christ. In verse 14, he calls this the flesh. Let's read verse 14, chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh. Sold into... And he's not talking about just his physical body. He's talking about a spiritual principle. I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For that which I'm doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Now, you see the word doing? That's really interesting. Because the word, he uses the word doing three times. And they're all three different Greek words. Three different Greek words for the word doing. Now, I'm going to give you that. This inner conflict is what James in the first chapter calls being double-minded. It's the inner war waged by the old patterns to take our captive will, our will captive. Look over at verse 23. He says, I see a different concept in the members of my body waging war against the law, the principle of my mind, to make me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. See, this, the old way, this old habit of life is constantly, we're constantly going back to it. You let go of the spirit and you immediately go back to it because it's your habit. And it's constantly trying to retake over your life to make you a captive. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, what are we supposed to do with our thoughts? Take them all captive in obedience to Christ. The sin nature wants to take your thoughts captive to serve 
lust. The Holy Spirit wants to take your thoughts captive, wants you to, wants you to empower you to take your thoughts captive to give them to Christ. That's the war. That's the battle. It's not with your outward. It's not even with your words. It's with your thoughts and your beliefs. See, thoughts create words, create actions. That's the process. So, let's look at a few principles. First, the flesh. Paul's term for the sin nature and the old man belief system. Because the corruption of sin is located in the human body. You see, when you got saved, you got a living human spirit and an eternally live soul, and we're still trapped in this sinful body. The body is sinful. It's the sin nature. It's in every cell of the body. The old man belief system is stored in the neural pathways of the brain. It's your body. That's why, we, listen, you're going to keep the same soul and get a new body. A, sin, a sinless, spiritual, perfect Superman body. Maybe even a superwoman body. We can hope, huh? What is a nature? A nature is an instinctive, inherent characteristic of something. Man's created nature in the garden was godly, became corrupted in the fall. The sin nature is in our physical body and causes a selfish, self-centered view of life instead of a God-centered view. We form our ideas around me as the issue instead of God. Listen, here's how you know, here, here's your sin nature. When you believe that what you need and what you want is so important that even God should be enlisted to give you what you want. Right? What I want, and you go, well, I'm not talking about what I want. I'm talking about what I need. God should be providing that for me. And what if he doesn't? You know, of course he does. Just we don't perceive it that way. But the sin nature says it's me, me, me. When we're denied what we desire, we become frustrated, we go into despair, we become disillusioned, angry, we blame others, we go into hatred. Now that's the sin nature. The solution to that is to yield your is to confess that and yield to the spirit. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. On the spirit side, you have to have logic to hold on to. He gives you this logic to think and hold on to. That comes from the Word of God. Now, when we're born without God, we form our ideas self-serving. They're self-serving beliefs, and we store these in the, in the brain. These are our habits. They become our automatic relation, uh, reactions to relationships and ex external events. In other words, the will becomes enslaved to your habits of thinking. The question, I know this is a lot. The question, why do I keep reacting to certain things in my life in this negative, sinful way? Why can't I bring myself, after all that I've learned and all that I know, all this time I spent with God, why do I still react in this negative way? Paul's going to tell you what that is. He says in point two, we'll get to it in point three. He says that two aspects of the sin nature of the old man belief system. On the one side, we pursue pleasure and the other, we prevent pain. God uses, God created our desires is the way that he motivates us. We're motivated by what we desire. Jesus called it hunger and thirst. We're driven by desire to pursue satisfaction and gratification and fulfillment from our relationships. Initially, all we have is the sin nature to, to, as our strategies, our worldly human sight. You walk by sight. That's initially the human way of doing it. Once you're saved, now you can walk by faith in the Word of God. So, desire, you see, you don't just obey God because you're supposed to. The goal, the Spirit's ministry is to 
bring your desire connected to the will of God because you want to. See, if you're doing the will of God because you must or you're going to be punished, that's called religion. That's not the, that's not the case. God's not going to punish you because you don't, you're not growing in his will. He's going to let you punish yourself, and if you get far enough, he'll bring discipline on your life, but it's not punishment. It's all positive. It's all nurturing. It's all trying to bring you to this good place. So, desire for the flesh or the spirit. And then the other side is the defense side, where these are mechanisms we use to warp our view of reality when we get hurt. You know, you get hurt in, in certain things in your life and you tell yourself, I'll never do that again. Those are, those are naps, never again policies. These are our defense mechanisms, the walls we build, the strongholds in our life to keep us from being hurt again. And what they do, they hinder you from being able to fully love and be loved. It hinders you from being able to allow the love of God to flow through your life. Thirdly, Paul uses these three words for doing in the book of Romans. He uses them all the way through, but especially in chapter 7, describing the believer's inner conflict. First of all, in chapter 7, verse 15, let's read that again. He says, For that which I'm doing I do not understand. And that word doing is the word caught ere God's am I. Kata Gadzumai is an interesting word in that it, it, it's kata, which means down. It means downward pressure. Ergadzumai is the word energy. It means energy under pressure, to hammer something out, to produce something, to work something out under pressure. It's to work your salvation out with fear and trembling. It's that word. And this word is used. Paul uses it. James uses it. Uh, he, Paul uses the word to describe a product or result that comes from the mental processing that occurs in the mind under some form of adversity or pressure. It produces a conclusion, beliefs, and behavior. So you've got this pressure in your life forcing you to make conclusions and reach, reach these decisions in your life. This is the pressure, all right? And what I see here is the pressure adversity causes us either to reject God or trust God. All right? And trusting Him builds confidence to endure with Him. <clears throat> when we trust the sin nature and the old way of thinking under pressure, it builds these habits of reacting that way. And that's why you're at this place in your life when certain things happen, you just automatically knee-jerk. It's just a knee-jerk reaction. That's why he says, what I'm doing, I don't understand. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing this? It's an instant, it's, an, it's a reaction. Now, do you have that in your life? Do you have reactions where you automatically, I shared with y'all last week that I formed a reaction of becoming angry when people got in my face. And I'm still working on getting rid of it because it's just, I just go there. Just go there. So, you know, some people react with fear. Some people react with anger. How about self-pity? You get depressed and discouraged. That's another one of my favorites. I really enjoy a good self-pity party. You know, woe is me, poor me. Rhonda's like flitting around like, She's like, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just a sinner. I'm just sinful. So it's just a reaction. It's your reactions that you've programmed in. And he says, I don't understand why I keep doing this. Then, and that word's very interesting. It's used all over the place. In Romans 5, 3, he says, we rejoice in our tribulations knowing that tribulation produces, there's your word, what? Perseverance. See, on the sin nature side, it produces sinful reactions. The pressure, boom. Where do you go to under pressure? To your default. That which is normal. He said also pressure, when you choose the Spirit, begins to produce in you this habit of trusting God 
called endurance, where you endure, you stick it out, you stay with God, you stay with God, you stay with God. Before you know it, he's starting to produce growth in you. So, the second word is, is translated practicing. He says, I'm not practicing that which I desire or intend. And it's proso. It's proso is what you customarily do. It's what you traditionally do. And it's, and it's a daily routine. Customary, regular behaviors. In chapter Romans 2, 1 through 3, he says, Judging others for what you also practice, what you customarily do. Romans 2, 25, regularly follow the law. And he says this word desire, thelo, is a desire and an intention to do the will of God. In other words, he says, I desire and intend to do the will of God. I wake up every day saying, I'm going to do the will of God. And yet I find myself not doing that. I react to my life in ways that I don't even still don't understand why I keep doing that. And I'm not practicing consistently the things I want to do, the things the Spirit is giving me to do. And then the third word is poeo, which means moment-to-moment -moment decisions. It's the most common word in the Bible for doing. So here's three ways of thinking about doing in your life is your instinctive automatic reactions this takes great concentration and determination to be able to begin to remove these reactions See, these reactions are what hurt your relationships it's not what you customarily intend to do it's what you customarily don't intend to do and these are the things where you get angry you go into fear People say, well, I'm not fearful, but every action that you take is defensive. It's all to make sure that nothing bad happens. When, when your whole life is characterized by avoiding pain, avoiding problems, that's fear. You, you're not able to see that God has got your back. He's got your front. He's got your everything. That you're supposed to walk forward, walk off the edge of that cliff, we used to talk about climbing up on the limb and sawing the limb off. And he's not talking about sawing it off over this way. He's talking about sawing it off over here. Remember that? So that the limb's going to fall and with you with it. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to walk off the cliff of your life, trusting that he's going to catch you. Or better still, that he's given you wings to walk off that cliff, but see your instinctive reaction says, no, no. God says, trust me, no. If I trust you, I might get hurt. I might be vulnerable. So I was vulnerable once in my life and that didn't turn out very well. See, here I am. That didn't turn out very well. I'm not gonna do that again. God says, well, if you can't be vulnerable, if you can't open it all up to me, then I can't, I can't flow my love through your life. Can't flow through you. It's not about you loving. It's about God enabling you to love with his love. Flowing through your life. You're just a spectator. Hopefully the Spirit's producing this lesson. I'm a spectator. I'm just hanging out here, enjoying it with you. So there's a lot more to this. It's just difficult to summarize it all. But I've enjoyed trying. Uh, the most difficult aspect of our sinful behavior to understand is the programmed habits of worldly thought that have become our automatic pursuits for pleasure and defensive reactions to the difficulties of life. That's the most difficult part of the whole thing. You get into chapter 8 and he gets into all the solutions. Wonderful solutions. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we have to have a whole new life in ministry in the Moody area in St. Clair County. And Father, if we can have anything to do it, it won't be Sinclair County. It'll be St. Clair County because we're going to 
help these people, these sinners become saints. And I pray that we could understand the opportunity that we have to fulfill all of these years of growth and, and doctrine and understanding and development, turn this into actual practice in a way that's going to influence a whole nother generation. Help us to see the image of influencing and impacting a small number who impact a, another small number and a greater number and a greater, creating a, a ripple effect through all of Alabama and beyond. Help us to understand the necessity of, uh, of, of giving the grace message to another generation. This message must go on, and we know you're going to do that. There's no question about what you're going to do, Father. But the question is whether we're going to take advantage of the opportunity to be part of it. So my desire is, is to be part of that in whatever way that you allow and whatever, to whatever degree that you allow. So I pray that for us, Father. I pray it for us as a church, as individuals. We love you. We thank you for this great opportunity. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen.